Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2016. Uh, can I remind everybody present that all electronic devices should be switched off at all times when the committee is in session? Our first item is to decide whether to consider our legacy report and annual report in private at our next meeting. Is that agreed? Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Um, our next item is to take evidence on the national performing companies focusing on the main challenges and opportunities facing the companies as they look ahead to the 10th anniversary of being directly funded by the Scottish Government. Can I welcome to committee this morning uh, Chris Hampson, Scottish Ballet, Roy McEwen, Scottish Chamber Orchestra, Alex Rudrick, Scottish Opera, uh, Laurie Sansom, National Theatre of Scotland, uh, and Dr. Krishna Tiharishan, uh, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. Uh, welcome, everybody. I know, uh, Alec, you have to leave about 10.45, I believe, and I, I believe Anne Monfries is going to step in to your place. So there'll be a swap there at, at around 10.45. So thank, thank you. you very much to Anne for, for stepping in. Um, we're going to start off uh, straight away with questions from members, and I believe uh, Mary Scanlon wants to start. Yes, um, I wonder if I can just go to the, the main issue of the day, which is funding, and just come on to uh, performances. But I wonder if I can just open up the questioning, um, uh, really just how direct funding is impacted on your operation, creativity, your independence, uh, and indeed your autonomy. And just if you could lump in there uh, the concern about the Scottish Government being the main funder and obviously the financial constraints that uh, we're facing just now, um, is there a problem, risk, you know, is there a risk depending on the government as your main funder? And uh, I wonder if I can maybe just, uh, if you could throw in... Uh, I was looking at other sources of funding and I appreciate the difficulties there, but uh, the figure I have for sponsorship and fundraising um, is 9.3% in 2007-8 and that's gone up to 11.7% in 2013-14, so 2.4% in seven years. So it's just as an opening uh, statement about is it difficult the sponsorship and the fundraising is are there risks depending on a main funder in difficult financial times and how does that impact on your operation creativity independence and your autonomy a, a nice simple question to start with <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to lump a few things yeah, together know, just to get a general we noticed, discussion Mary, we noticed, yeah. yes. um, who wants to kick us off alex okay. going first um, thank you for the uh, good question. Um, I shall do my best to address uh, as much of it as possible. First of all, I uh, just wanted to note that, in fact, in my view, having come from uh, having run other national companies in other parts of the world, I think the model we have here is extremely good. I think the, um, the link between the five national performing companies and uh, the Scottish Government has been uh, extremely strong. And, in fact, when I first came here 10 years ago, it was about to be enacted, and I had a moment of thinking, crikey, you should never wish for something because you might get it. And um, once we got over the initial sort of six to 12 month settling in period, I would say it's been an exemplar of, uh, of uh, relations and working model. Uh, That's good. Point one. Point two is I think we've benefited from the stability of having uh, the same minister in place for a good period of time. She's got to know the kind of cultural estate really well and has uh, been particularly effective at supporting uh, um, through the International Turing Fund the aims and aspirations, the international aims and aspirations of the five national companies and there's been a lovely gelling together and indeed that's the reason for my early departure today is because Scottish Opera is making its North American debut in Toronto later this week. That uh, your budget this year. I would also say that um, uh, and I guess I'm speaking for all of us that, you know, we, we, don't live, we don't live, work or breathe in isolation. So we're acutely aware of the pressure that both local and central, if you like, Scottish government is under. So as our funding rose to, uh, our, run, our funding has both risen and fallen, um, uh, we've all risen and fallen in funding terms of the same tide, if you like. And we rose to a peak in 2008-9, as I recall, and we've all quietly declined. Since then, we've all done our very best to be aware of and operate in constrained circumstances uh, and equally done our best to um, uh, find new and other sources of earned income including lifting box office all sorts of entrepreneurial, ide entrepreneurial ideas and of course uh, uh, fundraising and sponsorship curiously much as the need has come on us to find other sources of 
earned income. So many of the trusts we turn to have also had their income reduced or their funds available to disperse reduced. So uh, I think we're doing quite a good job of stemming the tide, but I, I don't think one should be under any illusions about how difficult it is to find other sources of earned income. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to... Throw on. Chris. Well, I'd also um, like to um, second Alex's comments. I think one person fact is that we do all work together as a, as a national portfolio. Um, that's of enormous strength when we face challenges um, with, with budget cuts. Um, and as Alex has mentioned, there, there is a balance in place where as budget cuts start to impinge on what we're able to achieve in the future as we look towards trust foundations, private funding, commerciality, we see that this squeezes in those areas too. But as a national portfolio, we're able to share intelligence on that and to work together to help to mitigate some of those financial cuts. Thank you. Uh, Roy? Uh, I, I'd agree with my colleagues that the, the relationship with government, I think, over, over the time has, has been an extremely good one. Um, and we've developed relationships both with ministers. I think it's given us a closeness to ministers that we didn't have before. Um, we have a very good relationship with the officials who've got to, a real understanding of the way the companies work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a weakness in the government being such a, a substantial funder of the companies, but it does make us vulnerable if there are major reductions. Uh, but that's happened following a, a period of economic recession where some of the sources of private money have, have come under intense pressure as well, whether it's corporate or trust and foundations or individuals. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's thrown into, uh, to, into contrast now that if, if you look at the point at which we changed from Scottish Arts Council funding to government, uh, there had been a history of 15, 20 years of real financial crisis in the national companies. And um, that was partly stabilised by an uplift in funding from the last year of Arts Council to the first year of Scottish Government. If you look at our grants for 16, 17 coming up, in cash terms, they're actually lower than the last year of Arts Council funding, uh, and uh, therefore significantly lower than the first year of Scottish Government funding. And that's, not take, that's cash terms, not taking into account inflation. Um, so the, one of the major benefits is being squeezed quite significantly. Having said that, I think the ongoing close relationship we have with government, the international touring support we've had, is, has been really tremendous. Um, and I think that's uh, done a lot to, to give the companies a higher profile and, and a greater recognition of the, our contribution as national companies to the, to the country. Um, the, the, the area of, uh, of private sector income, I think, is a, an important one to look at because as, as government funding has gone down and with pressure on public funding over the last few years, the areas which we've all been reasonably successful at is, is increasing private sector funding and mainly individual giving in the case of the, of the SCO. That's been a, a real development area. Um, so it's, 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 been, it's been under pressure, but actually in many ways it's been quite a good news story so far. Thank you. Laurie? Um, yes, I'd like to reiterate some of the comments. Um, I think we've only ever known direct funding because we're 10 years old this year, so it's only ever been direct funding in the government. Um, I just wanted to address something you asked about autonomy, actually, because um, I think we all share the sense that we have a very good working relationship um, in terms of both uh, sharing goals with the government and uh, how that's evaluated and how we report against them without ever feeling that content of artistic programme is ever being uh, influenced at all. So in terms of autonomy of what we make and what we do, I certainly feel that we are uh, entirely autonomous in terms of the work we do, but we do have um, shared uh, goals which we evaluate together. So that seems to work very well from our point of view. Um, in terms of funding, I think the pressures recently um, and looking ahead do give us all pause for thought, I think, on at what point further cuts might make us review our programming and, act, and act the, our models of activity because um, uh, at what point do we fail to be um, fulfill the remit of national companies 
if our um, ability to take work to the whole of the country, um, for example, is um, in, at risk is definitely a question that we all are asking ourselves. And of course, that means we are looking at how we diversify our income streams. And I think that's becoming necessary for all of us. We're all searching after the same individual private givers in some respects. Uh, that's one area that we're aware that we're in competition with, with, with each other. Um, and I think that we're all doing very well at actually uh, increasing that. Corporate sponsorship and business sponsorship, I think, has been slow over recent years. I think there's an upturn now. It's looking better. It looks like we're in a better position. Certainly, uh, businesses are, are more open to those conversations now. Um, but it's yet to achieve any uh, big wins from our point of view. But I think there's green shoots um, on green shoots on the horizon, to mix a metaphor. Um, so, uh, yes, there's, a, an, there's cases for optimism on that front and also cases for us to be cautious about what the future might, might hold, knowing that we're expecting a settlement not until the autumn for 2017 through to 20. So, actually, the uncertainty of that is also... Um, uh, it puts, puts us in a, a tricky position about future activity and future planning. So we're, we're, certainly we, we discuss that quite a lot together and uh, our approaches to it. Okay, thank you. Krishna. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to this committee for having us here this morning and giving us the opportunity to speak about these very important issues. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I am probably the newest face on this side of the table, I only uh, joined um, the RSNO in August, and I actually came here because of this type of funding model. Um, you're of course correct in, in pointing out the risk that if there's a single funder that has a certain percentage, that there's a significant risk if there are changes in that. But I think in our case, by having the government be so invested and frankly proud of its national arts companies, it also allows for us to have greater public participation and public buy-in of what we do, which is something that I think is incredibly important um, for all of us. Um, the funding model that we currently have allows for stability, stability not just financially, but also stability in creative planning. If you're allowed to uh, plan years in advance, you actually have a beneficial effect on excellence on stage. Uh, it allows the Scottish arts companies and the entire Scottish arts scene to punch significantly above its weight internationally, which I think is, is a very, very good thing. Um, with regard to where we are in terms of contributed income and earned income, as opposed to government support, um, the RSNO is trying right now <clears throat> to get to a place where we're about 56% government and the remaining t uh, 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 split equally in 22 earned and 22 contribute. Um, as my colleagues mentioned, we're all friends at this table, but when it comes to the contributed income, we're actually all competitors um, because there is a certain finite amount of philanthropic money available in Scotland. Second and final question, uh, convener. Um, I, I was, we have some figures here, and it's just a comparison between 2012-13 and 2013-14. And uh, you know, having looked at the sponsorship, looked at the funding, uh, it's a varying figure, obviously. But um, uh, the national, uh, the national theatre, for example, was down by about 25% of performances in Scotland over that one year. Across the UK, it was fairly similar, 135, 136. But internationally, you went down from 215 to 94. Uh, Scottish Ballet within the United Kingdom was half, uh, and Scottish Opera, uh, strangely enough, if I may say, went from three to 40 across the United Kingdom. So it's just a, a sort of varied figure, but I think probably the one that would stand out to me would be the National Theatre. Um, and uh, I think the other figure, seeing as this is my last question, uh, was again the National Theatre, and it was a number of education events uh, down from 834 to 493 just in one year. 
that's within Scotland and internationally down from 96 to 5. So I'm just wondering how that, these are figures that we've got from our Parliament's Information Centre, but I've no, no reason to doubt them. Um, but it does seem quite a drastic increase uh, just over one year, and I wondered if the funding had any impact. Sorry, I'm putting it all in the National Theatre here. But it's just to try, you know, the first question, and I did ask about operation, etc., um, and it was really just to look at these figures. I, I, I don't think any of us would want to see reduction in performances, and as an education, I, none of my colleagues, I'm sure, would want a reduction in the education events, and uh, although most companies were up, uh, the National Theatre was down significantly. Okay. <coughs> so, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that in, in general terms, okay. which is to say that it might be worth uh, taking a, another look at the figures over a five or seven year arc because inevitably the numbers go up and particularly outside of Scotland. Sorry. Yeah, but yeah. particularly outside of Scotland, the numbers fluctuate okay. according to opportunities. Yeah. So sometimes you can have, for example, we've had a major fluctuation from three to 40 because uh, in the summer of 13, we were able to take the Pirates of Penzance on tour around the rest of the UK. So that gave us 40 performances outside of Scotland. But those touring opportunities don't always uh, present themselves on an annual basis. So I think that would be a general reason for the, for the fluctuation. Yeah, I think it also doesn't necessarily um, explain what the event is, because some of those events can actually be capturing a considerable amount of people. So an event could be a workshop or it could be a, a performance that's working with 60,000, 60... I'm sorry, yes, I don't indeed. have any further information, but I'm just doing my duty to highlight it. Is it fair to say that, that, you know, taking Alex's point about year, year on year fluctuation, effectively, if you've got a, a new production that you're suddenly you're taking internationally or taking around the UK, as you've just said, Alex, you can see a sudden spike in, in the numbers and the following year you're, you're not doing that, and then the year it can go, next year it can go back up again. So, it, you know, it has to be taken over a longer period of time. It's very typical of us because our model is a theatre without walls mm, yeah. that actually um, we don't have a set model over a year of how many performances, how many education events. Every year is bespoke and every year is different. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why actually our figures tend to fluct fluctuate extremely. So our international um, audience attendance can suddenly skyrocket because we've actually got the James Plays playing at the Olivier Theatre in London for three months. Um, uh, and suddenly our percentage of work outside Scotland seems to, to bias that, but actually it masks the fact that that's because the, of the success of that production. So, over about five, seven, and eight And actually, years. it needs a little bit more analysis. Actually, yes, I think I, of what sorry, those events are, which I'm, I'm more than happy to provide further information for the committee around um, qualitative analysis on what those what those figures represent, if that would be useful. Okay. That, that, that's very helpful. Thank you, um, Mark. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, a couple of questions as well on um, funding and, and fundraising, just to ask how successful the companies have been in um, attracting funding from outside Scotland, particularly over, overseas, and what have been the costs of really going out and, and seeking those funders overseas? What's that? Roy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, outside Scotland, uh, some difficulty. There was... I think in the, in the run-up to the referendum, there was a, a, I don't know whether it was a real fear, an opportunity taken by quite, quite a large number of the major trusts uh, based in London to, to not invest in Scotland because they felt that uh, they needed to be sure as to whether they were investing in the UK or not long term. Um, so that's been a problem. As Chris said earlier, the trusts and foundations themselves have suffered through uh, their own investments losing value and therefore the income they have on an annual basis being much more difficult. Um, for the SEO, we found that in terms of outside the UK, um, uh, fundraising tends to be very specific to particular tours. So if we're in the Far East, we were in the Far East a couple of years ago and we managed to get uh, funding from an Australian bank. Uh, we went to India and we got funding from a uh, and, uh, oddly enough in India, a drinks distri distribution company for, for a tour in India. So it, the, 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 tour, the, the funding, private funding or corporate funding from outside the UK tends to be very specific to activities outside the country. Um, the main effort we put in has been in the UK itself and in Scotland in particular in developing individual giving uh, and, and that's actually been a, a real growth area. 
Yeah, yes. I'd just also add to that that um, with international touring and raising um, our, our profile internationally and that of Scotland too, which is you know, something all five of us are proud to do, um, one area that can be a little complex is tapping into that Scottish diaspora, if you like, in, especially in the United States or in the, or in the Far East. Um, there's complexities around the level of giving that can come back and setting up friends or associates in those countries can be quite complex. What we've concentrated on strategically is making sure that we're partnering with companies that um, have a, a strong Scottish brand and that are, able, that are based in Scotland that are able to help us achieve some international touring and thereby raising their own profile as, as, as well. Okay. Okay. Just going to share um, two, two small examples from Scottish Opera, one of which is that when the, when the company was first founded just over 50 years ago, there was a sort of friends, an American friends of Scottish Opera was formed that sort of morphed into a kind of Caledonian foundation and um, uh, was for the first 10 to 15 years enormously successful in providing funds from North America to Scottish Opera. But interestingly, as the participants of that foundation have aged, uh, they're now, most of them are in their 80s or 90s, the contributions from North America have pretty much ceased. Uh, secondly, we found when we were engaged in our capital project for the Theatre Royal to do the new foyers for the Theatre Royal, we had very little difficulty raising uh, funding from trusts and foundations south of the border because it was a capital project as opposed to for uh, revenue-related activity. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Mark. Um, other questions I had were, I know members of the panel have talked about the difficulty with basically all companies fishing in the same pond for private um, finance and private support. Are there any opportunities or any examples of all the companies um, working together to attract um, private funding on a shared basis? In some ways, I, th I think the instinct has been that we're likely to get more out of people if we hit them several times, if you like, <laughs> from each company than from, do, from doing it here. I think if we did it collectively, it would probably have to be for a collective project. Uh, oh, I think perhaps there's more potential internationally to um, gather together and make an impact in um, international territories. That's, um, we've had some success, I think, in New York, um, and I think there's, there's potential about where territories that we all go together. I think one of the places where we do um, add value to the organisations is the fees, that, certainly from the National Theatre of Scotland, the fees that we attract the major uh, arts festivals. We've just returned from, uh, in fact, we have the James Plays playing in Auckland at the moment, and they were just in Adelaide, and we'll go to Toronto in June. And actually, the fees that we get from those arts festivals allow us to remount the productions in Scotland. So there is a, um, a very direct financial benefit to the, to the company and to the Scottish taxpayer to those fees we get. Uh, we have a US board as well, uh, based in New York, and we're just now exploring how we utilise that more to be a fundraising board on behalf of the company. So we have um, two performances of the uh, Prudencia Heart in April at the New York Public Library, which is um, there particularly to, as a cultivation event around individuals in New York who might end up being substantial givers to the company. Just, uh, thank you, Convener. Just going to say that uh, a much less visible but important source of revenue for us is the rental of our productions offshore. So, for example, we've got um, Don Pasquale on its way to Miami, um, which will bring revenue back into the business, which helps then sustain other productions. We've also got uh, a production in Madrid, just finished in Madrid, and another production off to Cardiff. So that is, it's discreet and it's hard to spot, but it brings significant six-figure sums back into our business every year, which then in turn supports new productions. Okay, thank you. Uh, a quick supplementary, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, uh, I apologise, I have to go in about half an hour. Um, I just wonder, it, it's very encouraging hearing that, but I just wonder in terms of, you have physical presence across the world, but what are you doing in terms of internationally uh, screening trying to screen and stream some of your performances. If I go and watch you know, some classical music, I find very little of SNO, for example, I'm sure you'll change that. But what do we do to get to the, shall I call it, the virtual audience? I think that actually, um, 
digital broadcasting and, and digitalization of art forms really something that is just starting certainly for Scottish Bell I'm sure that my colleagues are looking at it as well and um, there's complexities in terms of um, intellectual property and grand rights um, when it comes to broadcasting and, and streaming and live streaming um, but there's opportunities to be on the front foot as well Scottish Ballet is the first ballet company to live stream from its studios um, and it's something we continue to do our digital audience is building year on year and actually one of our biggest um, the audiences for our digital output is the USA not Scotland which is quite fascinating when, when we have our presence in Scotland and in the USA we're able to tap into that digital market as well but there's there's plenty of scope um, in the future for um, further engagement with um, digital media because you mentioned the SNO the RSNO um, We've, we are looking very carefully, especially with the new building now in Glasgow, at uh, streaming some of our concerts, but we're looking more in the area of educational uh, concerts. So, for instance, school concerts. If I can't get to the Shetlands and the Orkneys, what I'd like to do is at least stream it live to an auditorium. Uh, we've spent some time in the last few months talking with organizations about their success of live streaming and especially their their perceived success of revenue live streaming. Um, Berlin Philharmonic is one of those organizations. And while I think that they've been very successful in tackling the technological side of it, they haven't actually been successful in making it a revenue earner in that um, the development of the technology is still more expensive than anything that you can realize by people paying fees back into the system. With the SNO and RSNO, um, we are in a fortunate situation. We have more than 200 recordings out in the field. And so at any given time, whether you're in Cologne on listening on WDR or whether you're in New York listening to WQXR or my brother currently in Los Angeles, he just texted me last night that he heard um, the SNO with WC. Um, you can hear us worldwide on radio stations roughly at least twice a week in any major market. For us, therefore, we feel that that traditional media is still the delivery point that connects us to roughly 5 million listeners in the UK through our association with Classic FM and BBC3, and probably another 5 or 6 million listeners worldwide through syndication. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, undergoing a, a strategic review at the moment of all our digital uh, work and looking at digital uh, broadcast opportunities within that. We've also used digital technology more as a way of distributing to um, further afield, and it's a model that I'm really keen for us to look at in terms of how we reach the whole of the country on a more regular basis, rather than it necessarily being a, a source of uh, revenue. As Christian has said, actually, it's whilst there's a, a couple of notable successes, such as NT Live, normally that's a star-led vehicle that actually is being monetized. So um, that's not necessarily the work we make. There might occasionally be a piece of work that happens to have a star name, but that's not our, our uh, bread and butter. So the model, um, those models don't necessarily suit us. But there is definitely untapped potential, I think, in reaching a, reaching a wider audience through digital and broadcast. I think we're in a similar position to the RSNO in that uh, our international profile at the moment is mainly through uh, recordings and extensive catalogue. There are a few obstacles with streaming and so on to crack. Uh, I mean, it's largely a resource issue. Um, in the case of the SCO, where we have a, an orchestra of self-employed musicians, um, there's, there's a payment required, and there's, on top of that, there's equipment and everything else that goes with it, and, and the skills, the technical backup. And at the moment, we don't have the resources to go down that route. But it, I think it's a pretty critical one, and particularly in a place of, like Scotland, where the population distribution, if you have people in remote areas that can actually hear live performances from major centres, um, that's an, an access question. Uh, and um, if the resources can be found, it's certainly a route to go down. Thank you. Uh, John. Convener, uh, over the past year or two, most public bodies have, have, have been having to make uh, efficiency savings and, and, and having to also meet the cuts and demands and uh, I do notice that you know the uh, the five national performing companies 
Uh, could you perhaps advise, advise me what kind of staff structure you have in place with regards to the funding you receive? If I might start with Scottish Opera, we're, um, we're, um, we're, we're, we've got a small core team, and then uh, and keeping, keeping it as straightforward as possible, we've got a small core, small core administration, in inverted commas team, our orchestra are on uh, uh, fixed term contracts of about, they're permanent employees, but they're on fixed term contracts of about 28 weeks a year, our chorus are freelance and all of our soloists uh, freelance and our touring teams are all seasonal according to the workload. So we've definitely stripped everything back in inverted commas to being as lean and flexible as possible so that we, when there is work, people are working as, as opposed to other models where everybody's employed all year round. So we, we've definitely moved to a kind of in inverted commas seasonal workforce culture. Chris, I'll come on to the rest, convenient, but, but just to go back to yourself, Alex, during this period then of austerity, have you made any cutbacks on any of your staff? Uh, we've not made any. We've not made any cutbacks, but we have, on occasion, chosen not to fill posts. Okay. Um, so, likewise, we're um, a very lean company. Um, we are 36 full-time dancers. However, our orchestra. Scottish Ballet's orchestra is brought in on a need-for-need -need basis. If the production requires an orchestra, we will bring them in for that. So they're not on full-time pay. Um, we have a very small technical team, which has in it a great deal of expertise that's been learnt over the last 46 years of touring. Very important team that keep make sure that our touring is as efficient as it can be. And compared to the other similar-sized, well, we are actually the smallest ballet company in the rest of the UK. Um, and yet we do take on probably far bigger productions than other companies of a similar size. So we're, I think we're about as lean as we can be um, in terms of um, making efficiencies within the staff. All of the staff pretty much have two, maybe three respon responsibilities. There's few people there that have one sole responsibility concerning senior management and heads of departments. Yeah. Tell me, Chris, how much uh, from the core funding actually goes in staff, uh, staff wages? Um, I, I, couldn't, I don't have that figure on me, but it's some, something I can provide okay. um, after this. I'd probably refer that same bit of question to Alex too, maybe could provide that. Roy? Um, we're the smallest of the national companies. We have 20 staff. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have an orchestra of 37, all of whom are self-employed. Um, the flexibility that that gives us is that we don't undertake work if we don't have the money to do it. But of course, that has a direct impact on the earnings of the, the players. Um, we have not reduced our staff complement in the last few years. Um, we feel we're working on the absolute minimum to sustain the programme of work we're doing. And we do have the lowest paid staff across the national company sector. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment about the percentage. I think I can work it out. <laughs> um, we have 48 full-time members of staff. Um, Similarly, we've, there, there's been a couple of posts that we've chosen not to fill, um, but we recently had an organisational review conducted by a, an external consultant who actually advised us what we knew already, which was actually everyone was working at capacity and we were actually understaffed for the level of activity that we were actually um, taking place. So there, there, was, there was precious little saving we could make there in reducing staff size without reducing activity. Um, but yes, so we, but in any given year, we will, in 1415, we then employ 700 uh, people over that year in terms of the freelance uh, artists um, and crew and uh, production staff who are making the work. So we, we go from 48 core staff to up to 700 people we employ over a given year. Perhaps again, Laurie might be able to provide us with uh, the figures just being set. Sure, yep. I'll, I'll do that. Doctor? Uh, I can only speak for the RSNO for the last six months. I have anecdotal data um, behind it. But um, we're basically working, I would say, on the office staff side at the absolute minimum of what we can do. But we've had, for the last two and a half years, a policy in place where we 
replace positions only on an absolute need basis. That's both in the office and on stage. Um, we fluctuate between about 28 and 30 full-time staff members in the office and uh, it can be up to four part-time uh, members in the office, but we're currently below that. Um, on stage, we should probably be somewhere between 92 and 96 full-time employed musicians, but we're currently having a few open positions there, which does create efficiencies, but we don't, we don't keep them open because we want the efficiency. Um, we're actually just basically very carefully uh, in a process of finding out who are the best people to join us. But that said, um, we're at about 80 musicians on stage right now, so we're not at full complement, and we have to use substitute players to do that. Um, it's difficult to give you the exact percentages that you ask for because there are different ways to measure it, but basically speaking, we try to keep the office, um, so the non-performing musicians, at about 12 to 15 percent of budget. Uh, obviously, that fluctuation is whether we have a large touring year or not a large touring year that increases the budget artificially. Um, and at this point, the uh, government uh, support of the RSNO no longer covers um, the, um, the direct operating expenses of the RSNO. So we're already relying on uh, contributed income and earned income to make up for that gap. Final question. Uh, can I can tell you if I've got this horribly wrong, but I, I'm, I'm estimating between 12 and 15 percent is, is uh, sa administrative salaries. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, one final question, and it was something that Chris had mentioned earlier on there that he's going to have this close relationship that you know he's working under this national portfolio, and uh, that being the case, then do you think then that perhaps somewhere down the line we could be moving to a national performing company? rather than national performing companies? Um, Maybe we only need one chief executive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, there's a, a very simple answer to that, in my opinion, no, because what we're able to do together as we are now is, is far stronger. We're able to supply um, Scotland's audiences with a very rich cultural diet. And engagement as well and that's um, to remember the amount of work we do beyond the stage in terms of education initiatives and outreach I think all of all of the components that go together to make the national portfolio are absolutely vital we do from time to time work together as companies on projects where we know that we can we can marry up skills and um, come up with some innovative innovative ideas um, but as, as one whole company, um, I think scheduling is already a, a major issue um, that we try and overcome whenever we work together. Um, I can see that becoming more and more complex in the future, probably. Can I, can I make an assumption that you all agree with that? <laughs> it's okay, thank you. At the point of which, I was just wondering if I should uh, unpack my boxes? Or if I should. Uh, <laughs> we went from Arts Council to direct government funding, there was a year when it was quite rigorously looked at, not necessarily the merger of the companies, but th whether there was areas for shared services and so on. And actually the, the restructuring was going to cost a lot more than the, the, the benefits in the f first few years. It was fairly minimal. Um, so w we haven't gone down that road. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, just before I bring in Gordon, I know Gordon's got a couple of questions. I know you have to go, so I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. But just before you, I didn't want you to stand up and leave mid-question, so to avoid that, is there anything you'd like to say just in general terms before you have to go? I know Anne's going to replace you, but is there anything general you want to, to just say to the committee before you have to go? Um, no, I'd just <clears throat> like to go back and re-emphasise a, a little part of my opening remark, which is that compared with other worlds I've inhabited with other national companies in other parts of the world, I think this is a pretty good model of how um, of how certainly an opera company can work and despite what you might read in the media occasionally about Scottish opera <laughs> uh, all I would say that is that I think in time there will be plenty of other opera companies in the UK who will look to us as being a good example if not a great example of best practice Great, uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you very much and can I, I'll let you go and, and, and welcome Anne um, to the committee um, Gordon just a, a quick supplementary on the, the funding 
My, my understanding is that under the criteria for being a national performing company, you have to demonstrate a year-on-year -year increase in private sponsorship and other non-public income. Now, looking as, as I did last night through the um, annual accounts of each of your bodies, I happen to notice a couple of, couple of comments. One was National Theatre of Scotland. Total incoming resources increased again in year from 7.2 million to 7.9 million. And Scottish Ballet said, um, box office income overall remaining strong. Targets were exceeded across the year by 30%. Income from fundraising and sponsorship increased by 48% on the previous year. And I, I'm just wondering, bearing in mind that you, you've got this obligation, uh, and it would appear to be successful, um, can you... Bearing in mind your competitors, is there anything you would like to say about what your strategy is in growing private sponsorship and non-public income? Pick up on that. And um, actually going back to a question that Mary asked me about the reduction in performances, actually. Um, but I was a little taken aback because my experience of 14-15 was that we, there was a great increase. And I just wanted to direct the committee's attention to the actual total audience participation levels for 13-14 and 14-15, which actually greatly went up. So we go from 69,000 in Scotland in 13-14 uh, to 90,000 in 14-15, and in, in internationally 29,000 to 38,000 internationally, um, and in the UK 21 to 103. That's on the basis of some large-scale pieces of work where we attracted that additional income through making pieces of work that attracted additional income from the National um, Theatre of Great Britain and the Edinburgh International Festival. So there's something about us... Um, actually creating projects which attract income, which are often quite large-scale, high-profile pieces of work. So we need the resource to actually take the risk to make those pieces to attract additional investment. The other um, major event, the uh, major piece of work we made was the Tin Forest, which was in Glasgow and was a nine-month community engagement project of, with its outcome at the Commonwealth Games and actually we were able to um, attract 800,000 of additional income from agencies, from private sponsors because of the scale and profile of the work. So it's just an interesting thing to note I think is that, that we can increase by 0.2 million our income. That doesn't, that we are spending it on, it's, it's ring fenced around particular projects and actually the, the larger scale of those pieces of work, the, the more chance you get to attract Try that additional funding. So I, I'd also like to add, Gordon, that um, with, with, with those statistics, again, it's, it's looking strategically over a period of time. Um, prior to um, 2012, our Basically, our winter season, our Christmas season is our most successful. Um, as you can well imagine, lots of people like going to the ballet at Christmas. We'd actually seen audience numbers starting to fall. Um, and so the figures of the box office having a resurgence was to do with um, two projects. One was Hansel and Gretel, which was derived by an education initiative. And the second was bringing back Scottish Ballet's Nutcracker, and that hadn't been performed for many years. So that surge of audience numbers is really what gave us a 30%, but coming from a, a position that had started to um, decrease. And the same with the funding. Um, the funding for those particular projects was very healthy. There was a lot of enthusiasm for those projects, especially with regards to um, Hansel and Gretel, where the initiative came from an education perspective and outreach. Um, but future years didn't attract such um, private funds, so you'll have seen a drop-off after that. So over the course of a three- to five-year period, you'll see this ebb and flow in trusts and foundations. Probably over time, what you do see is the trusts and foundations, even on the significant gives, starting to, getting, to be getting less and less. And I think one of the other challenges is that trusts and foundations start to... Um, tighten the criteria around how money is used, we're finding that um, it, it's very strongly ring-fenced, especially towards outreach and education. Um, so again, you, you'll often see quite a lot of money coming in from trusts and foundations and private sponsorship. But it's for, a, I'm seeing more and more very specialised projects that perhaps only run for a year or two years. So don't actually impact on the longevity of the, of the business, if you like. 
the strategy to increase contributions is actually a strategy that's twofold. It's, it concentrates initially on earned income. Um, so, to give you an example, we want to bring new audiences to the orchestra, people that may not have heard us at all. Um, uh, one of those uh, concerts that does that for us is the recent John Williams concert that we were very successful in producing both in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Most people don't realize that John Williams is classical music, even though it's also movie music. It's very good music. 65% of those attendees are first-timers to the RSNO, so that gives you an idea uh, of why this is successful. With uh, sold-out concerts, uh, about, we sold about 6,500 tickets over that weekend. Um, and the point is to introduce you to the organization, to make you fall in love with the organization, and when you're at a point in your personal uh, life situation where you can actually afford to also contribute to us, then we have obviously want to invite you to do that. But it's not simply finding somebody and saying, hey, I need some money. Um, we, we need to make the case that we as an organization are relevant to your lives. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Roy, did you want to add something? Uh, echoing Chris, the trusts and foundations and corporates tend to be project driven or they tend to be targeted at particular things. The area where I think we've made most progress is in individual giving, which is, if you like, creating a community of support around the organisation and individuals giving everything from £50 up to several thousand pounds. Uh, the one th thing to maybe remember about that in terms of administration is that that kind of generation of income is much more labour intensive. It, it does require a lot of hard work to get them and cultivate them and keep, keep, keep hold of them. As well, we uh, at Scottish Opera have just had success in raising funds towards the capital project at Theatre Royal. A project like that does attract attention and in a way is nothing's easy in terms of generating money, but it is an easier and uh, a very concrete project for people to, to give towards. Um, and in, in terms of other education projects, as Christopher is saying, anything that people can hook on to does tend to, to generate money with the, the trusts and foundations. And that can mean that it's, it's year on year, it's rather than having a, a longevity, which for some projects is preferable. So it's just finding a balance between, between those. Did you have a small supplementary? Yeah, Mary? just very small yeah. convener for a point of clarity. Uh, it's just to say the figures that I used were 2012-13 to 13-14, and the National Theatre audiences were down by about a third in Scotland, UK and international. But Laurie's figures were the following, the following year, year. Where, which proves the point that it's better to look at the yes. trend. But I just wanted to make that uh, point no, that's, of clarity. That's helpful, that we're, we're both right. <laughs> 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 or, or both wrong, I'm not sure. Or both wrong, yeah. But that's how no, important thank, trends are. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Liam. Can I maybe draw together um, the issue of funding we've been concentrating on? But in response to a number of questions, there has been um, kind of inference to uh, the expansion of audience, the, the access, the outreach um, work that the, that the national companies do. Orkney and Shetland, I was uh, pleased to hear, were, were mentioned. Um, I, the slight concern there was that there was, again, almost an inference that with funding pressures, digital and, and, and other means may be a way of almost supplementing the work that's going on. I was going to compliment the national um, companies on the extent to which you have gone out. Um, uh, the, the, the community I represent in, in Orkney has been rather blessed with um, the presence of the national companies on numerous occasions. I remember sitting watching Kosi Fantuti um, fairly recently. But actually beyond that, uh, a production from Scottish Opera in the island of Sandy, which is a population of about 500. And I think the concern would be if digital was seen as a way of supplanting that, what you lose is the, is the physical connection with the national companies, which I think is absolutely imperative. So in a sense, I'm seeking a reassurance that while digital and, and other options need to be explored for broadening the audience, it's not seen as a replacement for some of, I think, excellent work that's been done by the national companies. You. I think, I think um, the live event is completely at a premium here and um, we are always looking first to how we can be in more of Scotland more often because I think that's the question for me and, and I think actually we're, we're looking at um, models whereby we can be in um, 
more places more often. But uh, we, we were in Orkney as well doing a six-month-long engagement project resulting in ignition when I first arrived. Um, but for me, it's how often can we be there because it's one thing to arrive and, and bring a performance or make, make something with a community. But if you're not there for another three years, then are we sustaining and building and developing an audience in, in particular communities? So for me, I've got a question of how often we can be in certain places. I think something we need to look at. It is the thing that's most um, revenue intensive. It's the most costly thing um, from our point of view. Um, that doesn't mean that's how we judge whether we should do it or not. But um, we will be under pressure um, to sustain it because it's um, per head. It's, of, it's, of, it's much more costly, but it still remains right at the heart of our remit, um, and I'm sure for the government it will remain theirs. In the sense, is the, is the reassurance there what Chris was saying earlier about the, the, the trusts and foundations are tending to ring fence funding for that outreach work, and therefore, while it is more costly, and it will be costly, I suspect, for, for all of you in, in similar ways, that actually the, the, the trusts and foundations are recognising that, and in order to sustain it, are ring fencing the, work, the, the funding they provide. For specific that purpose. They're definitely more interested in supporting that work than other work. Um, mm. That's that's true. But I'm not just talking about the outreach and participation. I'm also talking about taking um, performances as far afield as possible. So our small scale touring is mm. actually what what is um, most costly to and, us. And in terms of that that point about sustaining um, the, the, the the effort and, and building the audience and building the participation, what evidence have, have you got as as national companies? as to how well you're doing at that. I mean, clearly there's always going to be more that you could be doing, but is there anything to show that um, because of the collaborative effort, uh, collaborative effort you were able to put in, that you've had some, some traction with that? I can certainly um, state that with our up-close tours, which are our tours that do go from Orkney to Gala Shields and, and everywhere in between, um, what's um, incredibly gratifying about those tours is seeing the impact on the communities, seeing the fact that our presence there on the stage, we know we know we, we're, we're high achievers on the stage, but it's within the community as well. So we, we always tie in education outreach pro projects to where we are. I think in terms of um, our impact um, nationally, it's something to note that when we're present in Inverness, the average journey time for an audience member is anywhere between 90 minutes and two hours. And certainly for our Christmas seasons, we know that people do come from the Highlands and Islands and will stay overnight in Inverness just to see a production. So I think audiences are being built. Um, and I think there's, there's um, a requirement from all of us, and I'm sure my colleagues will agree, to make sure that we continue to commit to service um, those audiences as best we can. It is... Um, costly it does it does put great pressure in terms of our tour planning but I would reiterate our absolute commitment to making sure that we are present physically in those communities I think the digital aspect is just something that it enhances um, what we're able to do it also enhances um, our creativity so it's not just about putting out there something that you might see on stage digitally we can also create works that can only be viewed digitally. Um, so it's not about giving those people a, uh, a lesser performance experience. It's absolutely about enhancing the performance experience to as many people as possible. And in terms of broadening that access, that's broadening the access geographically. In terms of broadening the access socially, what efforts have been made in, in that regard? I mean, I've, thinking in particular of, of ticket pricing will have a, a real impact on, on, on take up and access. Is there anything you can say in that, in that regard? Um, one thing we talk about actually quite regularly, which is actually ticket yield. In other words, how much you can get per ticket in Scotland is much lower than um, the rest of the UK. And actually, I, I think in, um, although, although that hides a more complex picture, um, it's not something we should feel concerned about. In fact, it's something we should welcome, I think, because, it, because I think in Scotland, um, unlike some of the rest of the UK, certainly in terms of um, theatre going, it prevents it from being such an elitist activity. Um, but it, that does mean that 
our earned income from work is much lower than actually it can be in other in other places. So actually, we we look at touring to the UK and internationally to actually subsidise the work that we the tour, touring in Scotland. Um, it's for me imperative that we keep ticket prices low so we're opening access but also that we're encouraging first time attenders through particular schemes um, we have a first nights uh, project where we give f um, free tickets to young people who've never been to the theatre before to come to a first performance and we uh, we make it a social event we introduce them to some of the artists involved and it's it's initiatives like that and targeting certain groups who are perhaps underrepresented in our audiences that I think we all do actually to quite a large extent to make sure we're diversifying who act, who's access, accessing the work. So you, you, you capture in your report back on them and how you track it over mm. over time in terms of the, the engagement of, of, of those demographics. To, to give you perhaps a few uh, concrete examples from the RSNO, um, our lowest entry ticket price is six pounds. That's for anyone under 26. Anyone under 16 uh, can come for free. Um, we also have uh, even a, a scheme in place that if you've recently become unemployed, that there's a bursary so that you can continue to be connected with your orchestra. Um, when we're talking about people who have difficulty coming to the hall, um, we also should mention that we all have um, an aging population that we have to be mindful of. So one of the things we've recently instituted were lunchtime concerts because it's very difficult for some people to be out and about at night. They just don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, I think all of these measures um, are imperative, um, but it starts with the work that we do with, with the young population. It starts with the schools, it starts with the primary school concerts where we're now targeting 22 schools in underserved areas um, around Glasgow, and if that's successful, we want to take it across the country. Um, going all the way as early as nursery concerts, um, the CD Astar that the RSNO created, which was distributed now to roughly about 180,000 um, newborns and, and their families. Um, the, the idea is that, again, we have to be relevant in people's lives. I would like to very briefly, though, come back to your concern about us being present in the um, geographical sense in the outer regions of Scotland. And as you rightly mentioned, there is, there is an expense associated with that. You have to get a 100-piece orchestra all the way up there with the cargo and so on and so forth. The digital media is a way to be in touch for those off years. I think it's unrealistic to expect that we can be everywhere all the time. And yet, over the last three uh, years, um, the RSNO has been in all 32 districts in Scotland. Um, our last actual residency in, in, the, in the Shetlands uh, was in 2012. Um, it's been far too long and we'd like to go back. So what we have to do is we have to create strategies that we have on and off years. So every two years, every three years, but actually try and incorporate it in the budget so you're raising for it, so that you know it's coming. I think the, the, the risk in all of this when we're talking about funding and when we're talking about government funding possibly being reduced is that it forces all the companies to become more entrepreneurially focused. And what that means is that you are trying to get paid work and what happens is the more paid work that you have to accept, it clashes with the weeks that you could go and do this kind of work that we think is equally or perhaps more important but isn't supported financially. I just reiterate uh, again at Scottish Opera, which can be perceived to be an expensive art form, um, but again in Scotland it's much cheaper than it is elsewhere. But our philosophy is to keep a broad range of prices, so either through discounts or just having um, a, a very low price as the cheapest price and the high price. Um, certainly when we're out on the road in the, in the more remote parts, we keep our prices as low as we possibly can to make that... Um, an access point because we see that very much as being a um, getting to people who love opera who, but live far away from where it's normally given but also getting to a community and making an offer to them that, that they may know nothing about so making it a very low risk entry point level to, to experience opera and hopefully grow their, their love of doing it. Um, I agree with my colleagues in terms of digital we see that as being a, a way of fulfilling um, our 
our supply, as it were, um, in, in those years where we can't go. We tend to go to about 40 or 50 towns and villages around Scotland in a year. There are obviously a lot more towns and villages around Scotland, so we can only go every second or third year, but we want to maintain that relationship. So that, that might hopefully offer us an opportunity to, to fulfil that and to build that relationship, keep that relationship going. Um, it's certainly not anything we would want to ever stop doing. It's a very important part of the, the company's work. Um, I was in Mark Inch at the weekend and just talking to people in the audience. I'm a marketer, so I talk to the audience. That's what I want to do. Um, they are so delighted to have this happening on their doorstep in their space, a space that is part of their community. Um, that I don't think anyone can, can take away from the value of doing that work and what that brings to people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> you also, I mean, a number of years ago, I, I went to a lunchtime Scottish opera. It was in Edinburgh, I grant you. It wasn't anywhere remote, but that lunchtime offering, uh, I don't know if you still do those, but that, that seemed to be very popular at the time. I'm going to have to research that. I'm relatively new to the company, <laughs> so that predates me, but I will have to look into that because, I, again, Krishna said nighttime doesn't always suit everyone. Some people, and, and operas tend to be quite long. So it was very much a cut down, it was obviously a very cut down yeah. version for lunchtime audience. Yeah. Uh, so, effectively, you could, you could leave your office, uh, you know, go have your sandwich, mm -hmm. watch, and leave and go back to your office in, you know, in, in that space of uh, lunchtime, which seemed to be fairly popular. Yeah, we but do offer a, what's called a opera unwrapped, mm -hmm. which are now early evening. It may have been the same thing. They're early evening, which has the full orchestra mm -hmm. singers. And it's basically a talk through the opera as an, an easy introduction to, to the plot and, and some of the secrets of how things work backstage. To get to It wasn't that kind of thing, thing but yeah. maybe it's Laurie. Um, I think one of the um, points actually that's coming out is that uh, pricing is not the only area where making work accessible needs to focus. And sometimes it's about the time of day. Sometimes it's about the needs of particular audience members. So I think we all look at accessibility in terms of we do audio described performances for those with impaired sight. And we obviously we do signed and captioned performances. But we even have started doing relaxed performances, which are, which are for um, people with profound additional needs, such as some, being somewhere on the autistic spectrum. So there's quite a lot of areas where we're always trying to innovate in terms of how we reach the broadest uh, population in Scotland to make the work accessible, which is not just about pricing, it's also about how we distribute it and how we produce it. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, George. Yes, thank you. Convener, good morning. Uh, I would like to add, build on some of the questions that were already asked by Liam and the convener is about the access point. Now, I can remember the first time my dad took me to a football match, but I, I don't remember, it was actually as an adult before I went to any of, the, uh, of your own organisations. Now, how are we actually, the, what are you doing in the educational, I know you've mentioned some of it, set up to actually make sure you get that access point from a young stage where a young person can engage with the company and actually the, becomes part of their life and, as you said, be relevant to them as well. Uh, and also, uh, where, you know, the... What type of access points I take on board that you, you mentioned about the RSNO with regards to the John Williams night? Any Star Wars fans, Superman fans, going to, you're going to kid them on. They're not going to know it's classical music because it's stuff that they've been actually lived with throughout their uh, generations of their family. So where are we getting more of that type of thing where we're using the populist route to try and get, and I know in uh, Bali and opera, you've obviously mentioned in Bali, the, the Nutcracker was a classic example of everybody wants to go at Christmas time to go and see that. So where are we doing more of this to try and use them as the access point, the stuff that people understand and know to get in there and fill basically your uh, audience and, and build the audience? Uh, start and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. We have at the RSNO, we have a uh, music for life strategy, which as I mentioned starts with when you're born and there should be at least one touch point um, through your entire growing up. Um, student tickets uh, complement that and then obviously you become hopefully engaged with the organization um, and we even have um, uh, things um, intergenerational access points where we had um, absent friends program which actually dealt with hospice care and the issues arising out of that and how it can be creatively coped with um, 
we also have young ambassadors, um, and this is, by the way, a way for us to get young ambassadors from the Shetlands and the Orkneys to come to the RSNO if we can't come to them. These are uh, young people who come and work with us over a period of time. Uh, in that vein, what we also have is a takeover. Um, we actually allow um, for one day every year uh, a group of um, young um, uh, students, I think they're in the age group 15, 16, 17, so people who are thinking about what they might want to be uh, when they graduate, uh, come into our offices and take over running the RSNO, where we become their interns and they actually get to see how the whole thing works. We were, in fact, uh, in final stages of doing something with Paisley. I'm not quite sure where that sits right now. It's been a little bit difficult to put it together, so you might have some <laughs> you might have to. I would never do that, sir. I would, that's not my style. Is it a um, pat on tie? Is that what's going on with? <laughs> but um, but um, uh, I think the, the difficulty is that you can always do more. Um, but I think I feel very com I actually feel very comfortable that we're within our means doing as much as we can. Uh, I mentioned the primary school concerts are coming back online because of our new building. We now have a, a different kind of cost control in place inside the new RSNO center, which is very good and allows us to have up to 600 people come and uh, experience the orchestra very close up. Um, so the John Williams is a, is a particular example I cited because uh, we continue to perform up to six of these types of concerts a year. Um, we, will, we will bring them to the audiences as the demand increases. But I think it's also really important not to create what I would call a shadow economy. Um, what we want to have happen is we want to have people that then transition from these very popular concerts also to the mainstream regular concerts. And here the RSNO I think has been very successful because on average we have a ticket sales event for each concert of about 1,400 tickets and we run up to three concerts a weekend. Um, it highlights the difficulty and that's why going back to the opening question I think this model is so good and frankly speaking is so very necessary to have government support. None of our organizations here are only concerned with one market and one city. We are all concerned with the entire country. And um, I think you will agree with me that Glasgow and Edinburgh have very distinct interests as to what they think is good or not good or mediocre or bad. In fact, Glasgow and Paisley will have very distinct ideas of what they really want. And then we're going out into Dundee and Perth, and in fact there's a collaboration between all the major orchestras in Scotland, including the one that's not at this table today, the BBC, uh, Scottish Chamber Orchestra and RSNO jointly um, run and actually subsidize a series in Perth at the Horse Cross, um, which wouldn't be possible for Perth to have that. And if you think about the size of the city of Perth and you look at other comparable cities in, in Europe or in the United States, forget the United States, there's nobody in the United States that'll have three world-class orchestra coming to do a six series concert. But in, in Scotland, we have that. Um, so I think that highlights just how well this actually works. In many respects, the, the kind of pattern of work that Krishna's just outlined is very similar to ours. We, we, it is, a, in some respects, a cradle-to-grave strategy of, of lifelong learning. And uh, we have concerts called Big Ears, Little Ears, which are actually um, tolerant spaces for parents to bring young children. Uh, we also do a series called Masterworks, which is taking major works from the repertoire into a school's audience, taking the piece apart, putting it back together, and um, playing it right through. So if you like, there's a, a demystifying of the music. And we also then track those people through to special offers for coming to main concerts in our main series. Um, and we go into schools. We've just been doing a, a very interesting project in Wester Hills. Um, so there's a, a variety of ways in which I suppose it's bringing young children right into direct contact with musicians and it, creating a spark which you then hope you can track through for the rest of their lives and into live performances and an appreciation of music. Um, so I think that, that that live experience, just going back to what you were saying, Liam, it, it's, it's all about, we're all about a live experience and creating that direct contact with people at all ages. 
I think the, the, the access point is absolutely essential. I think we've all probably got in, in our organisations cradle to grave programmes, if you like. One that I'm particularly proud of with Scottish Ballet is we developed um, Wii performances. So they're, they're, they're bite-sized performances of the full-length productions. And there is a time of day where, you know, you know, carers can come um, with the people they're caring for, parents can come, guardians can come. It's an hour out of the day rather than a two and a half hours. It's at a, a convenient time of day. And with that, we've also developed the relaxed performance. I know Laurie was speaking about those too. It's something we just, we've just taken on board in the last year. And that gives an amazing access point um, to those with, you know, really very, uh, very strong needs and at, not just for, for those individuals, but also for the people that care for them. And to be able to do that in a very safe environment, you cannot have 2,000 people in a theatre. You've got to have 200 people in a theatre maximum. So, and that's really important that we start to develop those understandings, not beginning to understand what it is that our audiences need to be able to access the particular art form. Um, we've got some amazing education initiatives We've been working with um, some children that have been marginalized from mainstream education, normally through behavioral difficulties. Um, and we closely link um, those projects with what's happening on stage. And in the background, we're training our own dancers, the Dancers Education Group, to be able to deliver projects with our education team so that those young people, they're not just learning about the art form and how to express themselves, um, through art, but they're also seeing those people that they've seen on stage, they're engaging with, you know, they're in front of them, having face-to-face -face engagement with them. I think there's nothing more inspiring for young people than to actually meet people that have blazed a trail in one art form or another, because they'll have all have come from very different backgrounds. And being able to share that experience, I think, is a really inspiring thing. Mysticism of the, the art form in itself makes that's it right. real to the individual. Yeah, I, I think that's you know one of the most gratifying things actually for the performers is to hear that the audience members also have their own stories as well, and I think you know vice versa that um, these young people can can hear that a lot of these performers have had their own particular journey, and that they're from across the world, and I think that's really important to note that. The, the companies are attracting people from beyond Scotland, which is also really important. And then another access point that we've alluded to is we are facing an aging population. And actually another access point is we, we operate um, Regenerate, which is um, it's actually titled for the over 50s, but it goes quite um, far beyond that. Um, and it's been so successful that we've actually formed a very small company so that those individuals have an outlet to perform and an outlet to express themselves as well. Um, and we're just noticing that that all feeds into those different parts of society that are going to engage with us more and more. It's absolutely vital to everything we do. Um, yes, well, um, we've talked about a lot of the models that we use in terms of our participation and outreach work and some of those that we use are something like Transform where we worked with 20 schools across the country alongside the Curriculum for Excellence um, and actually some of the anecdotal evidence of how that changes people's lives um, is some of the most powerful evidence I think we have. So um, the head teacher of uh, Port Glasgow High School attributed a 14% increase in attainment across one particular age group with their um, participation in this transform project. And I don't think we can underestimate how certain young people um, need uh, unconventional ways of uh, exploring the world. And I think the arts companies can provide that. One um, thing that we're about to launch um, is the school's touring network. Um, we identified with the leading children's theatre companies across Scotland, who are world class, by the way. I mean, the, um, Scotland has some of the best um, children and families um, companies in the world, um, but they were reporting that their their work was not getting to schools any longer. And this was partly because the cultural coordinators were no longer operating in local authorities and the infrastructure had just vanished. 
So um, we've been working with Imaginate, um, who's one of the leading companies, and we're doing a two-year pilot scheme to take two of these pieces across Scotland and trying to get them to as many local authorities as possible as a pilot scheme to see what kind of infrastructure will be needed to get that work into every school in Scotland. Um, that's the long-term ambition. That's a, that's a um, that's a big ambition and would need um, resourcing. But I think it's essential that we take the children of every age are regularly seeing the world-class work that's being made in this country because I, I don't think we can underestimate the uh, increase in um, well-being and academic attainment and then that will be our audiences for tomorrow. Um, we've been already talking to Creative Scotland about it and um, it's clear that it could be a model that works for other art forms too but it's about breaking down those barriers which are stopping schools from booking, regularly booking work of excellence which exists uh, we have it, um, but we're not necessarily joining, creating the infrastructure where it's easily rolled out. So that's something that we're piloting over the next two years and looking at what, how we create that model to try and get that work into every school. It's a passion of mine, particular passion of mine, when we talk about the attainment uh, you know, issue. Uh, you can't underemphasize the, the importance the arts has on getting a young person back on the kind of right track again in order to... to uh, it's something I think we should develop more here ourselves as a committee and discuss more within the parliament because I think it's an important, crucial part of the debate. Sorry, I just... Um, oh. Mr. Chopra's um, perspective, similarly, we have generational um, covered through the generations, starting from baby O and kid O um, and primary school tours, which we try to... Um, tie in with the curriculum for excellence and um, tie in with other themes such as um, health issues or healthy eating or this year we've got a, a tie in with the Festival of Architecture and looking at protecting our built heritage um, so working together with partners in getting other messages across to, um, to children while they're, they're still quite young and we then tend to move on to um, developing young professionals, so people in their teens who maybe want to aspire to, to work within the arts. We have a whole programme of Connect, which involves a chorus, um, an orchestra and stage management. So uh, we bring those um, young people together to work and create their own works, but under the supervision and help and guidance of the expertise that we have within the company um, to present their own work and get used to working on a stage, finding a place to... to um, to, to show what they can do, build their confidence um, for, for the future. Um, we do also um, offer Schools Unwrapped, which is this very basic in introduction to opera, which is free, so bringing along classes of school kids to, to see what opera can do, and again, giving away a few secrets of stage, stagecraft, <laughs> um, opening up opportunities in terms of future professions. Um, and we also offer an emerging artists programme, so once people are for, on that first rung, of their, of their professional career, giving them an opportunity to, um, to be immersed within a company and take advantage of the various um, opportunities within that um, and go on from that to, to build their careers. So um, people like Karen Cargill have been come through the company in that way and gone on to international um, stardom. So there are, there are processes for doing that. Um, and, and projects in place to try and interact at, at every level. Similarly, we have a, a project which we've been working on for a number of years called Memory Spinners, which works, again, with very small groups, but people with dementia and their carers, um, which allows the carer a bit of respite and a bit of um, freedom to express themselves and, and gives the dementia sufferer some time to... The, the voice and singing it seems to have been found a place within caring for dementia. It's something that stays with people, they will remember lyrics to songs when they may not remember anything else. Um, so just working with them in a very relaxed environment, small groups, um, to give people confidence and just a bit of a break from, the, from their routine to find a new, a new outlet for their creativity. So. Can I ask one final question? Yes, be quick. Uh, basically, it's just on uh, opportunities. It's just, you, you've talked about how positive it is working within the environment here in Scotland as national companies. Is there anything internationally that you think that you're aware of that could be brought and used here because obviously there's other ideas elsewhere is there anything you can think of that we could possibly look at interesting question i think 
in terms of participatory theatre work, Scotland's a world leader, actually. Um, but we're, we're doing a festival in, the, in October at Tramway called Home Away, where we're bringing five international companies over with five Scottish companies to actually explore what models are, are going on in other parts of the world. So from Jamaica, from India, from New Zealand, those companies are all coming to Scotland to actually uh, have a focus and a symposium on excellence and models of reaching particularly hard to reach groups so um our, well, what we can learn from our international partners and what they have already um are looking to, to take from us is, is actually becoming more important actually in this in this work and outreach work I think, one, I think one area that scotland leads in terms of dance is actually um with integrated companies those living with disabilities um and that's something we've started to work with independence a group based in glasgow um, about looking at that but actually from across the pond over in the usa we've, we've been partnering with the mark morris dance company and looking at um, working with people living with parkinson's and that's a project that we're just starting a pilot 18 month pilot this year so there are initiatives in other countries that i think we can learn from but i think we're probably pretty on the front foot about bringing those in and making sure those partnerships um, and not just brought in and, and, and delivered, that they're actually brought in and we grow them and we make them our own. Of an orchestra, um, the RSNO is one of the leading companies in the UK and it's actually perceived also to be one of the leading companies worldwide, which um, brings me to a curious thing of what we can bring from the rest of the world to Scotland, and I think to Scotland in general, which is that we should be very quietly confident that we're actually extremely, extremely good. Not, not, not usually a trait you expect from Scots. So. <laughs> the, the other thing, um, well, the other thing is that because an orchestra brings uh, conductors and guest soloists from across the world to Scotland, by doing so, we are actually bringing their philosophy of art making into Scottish concert halls on a regular basis. So I feel that we have a really nice give and take between what we have to offer as a Scottish national company and what they bring to us from their background as well. Okay, thank you. Um, did you have a supplementary? Lee? More a brief plug, actually, in terms of what Laurie was suggesting in the, in the symposium. I, I think ahead of the children and young people, or as part of the children and young people's bill scrutiny here, um, we were very focused on the, the issues around uh, care leavers. Um, and actually what was interesting is that one of the introductions we had to young people going through care was through the medium of theatre, which allowed them to give expression to their experience, etc. So I think if, in terms of, of the work you're doing to, to look at how you get to harder to reach uh, groups, I would, uh, I would, I mean, I'm sure we can share the details of, of that with you. That would be great. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that's been a success for us was a project that we did in Glasgow and Fife called Jump, which was uh, working with young uh, teenage boys just before they were they, who were at risk of entering the criminal justice system and identified as such. And actually, our model is always about empowering them to tell their stories. And we used a free running parkour uh, as a means of doing it. It was so successful in... in these, these boys who sometimes hadn't expressed what their frustrations were and their, um, about um, their lack of opportunity and what their future might be, that it was picked up by the British Council and we've just um, been uh, making it in, uh, in Jamaica with, um, with young, young boys who have a different set of issues um, um, and in some ways more extreme. Um, but that was one of those models where you see the transformative effect it has on individual lives, and it, that would be it would be great to talk to you about those those care leavers because I think that we we could do as much of that work as we have the resource to do to be honest because there's a huge need for it thank you <clears throat> Colin thank you Vera. I, I suppose it's inevitable where public money is involved that the first thing you want to do is start measuring things and I would start by saying. How do you actually yourselves measure success as a national performing company? We use part of it is the co our coverage of the country. Um, there's entirely quantitative targets such as um, audiences, participants. Um, 
the subsidy per seat, the efficiency in terms of the lowering the subsidy per seat. Um, and also beyond that, in terms of our education and outreach work, that tends to be assessed per project, uh, have that worked on and, and assessed by feedback from those who have taken part. Uh, the government itself, of course, has a number of peer assessors who write reports on our work, um, which uh, are open to us as well subsequently. Um, and also, I suppose, there's the critical, uh, perhaps above all, the critical response of the audience and the, the music profession and the music press about the quality of our work and the, um, the standing of the company internationally and against our, our peers. So in, in different qualitative and quantitative ways, I think we look at all of those. I mean, how do you yeah. bring it all together? I mean, some things will be better than the other. Yeah. Uh, how do you bring all that together to say this company is a success? Well, I suppose if we're doing high quality work and not getting ourselves into financial difficulty, we're a success. That's in very broad terms. But I mean, I think all those factors inform whether we are uh, a success. To some extent, the extent to which you're a success is in the judgment of other people as well as ourselves. I think mm. as well, uh, I'm sure Roy's probably summarised a lot of what we're all going to be saying because, uh, you know, we all, we all report back um, in, um, annually. Um, there is, of course, critical and peer review and the independent assessors from within the sector. Um, but I think, importantly, um, a measure of success is, I think, um, knowing that we're still creating new art, that we're not relying on, um, you know, too much on, on what's gone before. And I think, particularly um, with our, over the last five years, we've created an enormous amount of new work um, for Scotland. Um, and it's a mark of success that it's taken on to international touring and taken um, to be showcased either at the Edinburgh International Festival or for us at the Sadler's Wells in London, which is the main dance house um, um, in London. So th there's other, um, with, with it probably within our own sectors, some other marks of success um, that, that we can be um, judged by. Yes. Same answer for everybody. Sim similar answer. I mean, there, there's, there's other things such as uh, awards in, in terms of theatre. That's probably most appropriate. Um, there's a, many, many different award <laughs> schemes. Um, but I, I think there's something that we all value, which is how significant we feel culture is being in public life in general. Um, for me, that's a, that's a, uh, it's a difficult thing to measure, but an important thing to measure. So um, I think during... Uh, um, 2014, I think that w the contribution the national performing companies had and, and the theatre sector as a whole in a national debate was was exemplary, actually. Uh, I think it was, we all, uh, as a theatre company, we're most most directly making work about specific social political topics. And we, we trod a very... Uh, a uh, delicate line of, not, of making work that allowed artists to express their own passionate opinions without us taking a political viewpoint as a company. And I think that was a mark um, from, from my point of view of a company that was thriving in that we were able to be a focus for people's dreams, hopes, aspirations, frustrations, and we were a place where we could, we could create a place for debate. So for me, that's a really significant part of the question of whether we're being a success over and beyond the quantifiable things. We all have KPIs that we, uh, we can measure very specifically outcomes and, um, and, we, and the assessment meetings that we have, both six monthly and year annually with the, with the government, also me measure us against all the things that Chris and Roy have already spoken about. Inevitably, money counts. How do you measure the economic impact of your companies? Sorry, can I just, I'm going to start with Anne. I'll come along with me. Anne. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> um, I'm probably not the best place person to answer this. I might just hand on to Krishna if he doesn't matter, he mind. Because well, there, there are multiple ways to measure it. Um, there's the direct impact, which at the RSNO, if you take the fact that we have what we just mentioned, the people in the office, the people 
uh, on stage. Um, then we have uh, 432 junior chorus members, 200 senior chorus members. Um, if you add together the guest artists and visiting artists, um, the impact is to roughly 800 people annually that are somehow either employed by or on stage with the RSNO. And then there are um, government studies that depending on what project you look at, um, the secondary impact is by a factor of 2.3 or by a factor of 7.1. It depends on which type of activity you're looking at in terms of additional pounds being generated from what you're doing. If the RSNO engages with roughly about 150,000 audience members throughout the year, those people go out and have coffee, they go have dinner, they stay in hotels. Um, we just heard some people ac actually travel for miles. We've recently had people coming to our concerts flying from the continent and from New York to go and hear our performances, so that's hotel rooms in Edinburgh and Glasgow, respectively. Um, it's rather easier in some ways to uh, measure the economic impact of that project. How difficult is it to, to measure the overall impact of your activities through the year and its contribution to the economy? Because clearly culture does have a, a major impact on the economy. I mean, your, your question begs the answer, well, it, yes, it is very difficult to measure it because there are lots of invisible ways in which we um, affect the economy. Uh, I think also in that um, I think all of us have talent development schemes and opportunities where we are actually supporting the development of artists at a much earlier part of their career who are then going on to work with other cultural organisations in the, in the company and generating the, the uh, flagship productions of tomorrow. So we're all, all involved in that as well. Um, the indices that um, Krishna have mentioned are imperfect measurements but give some kind of sense of that additional impact and the employment figures kind of speak for themselves. I, I'm not quite sure beyond that how we, how we go about measuring it. I suppose I'm surprised that there's, someone hasn't come up with a formula. <laughs> we're by, we're by Those indices are formulas that Krishna mentioned. Yeah, there, there are actually uh, government studies on both the financial impact and I would actually, and I'm not trying to uh, divert the conversation, but I would say equally important is also the impact on well-being. Uh, and I just happen to have right in front of me here this uh, quote, which is from Scottish government social research in 2013. The study is called Healthy Attendance, the Impact of Cultural Engagement and, and Sports Participation on Health and Satisfaction with Life in Scotland. And one of, the, one of the important statements here is that people who were participating on a regular basis with cultural events reported 60% of those people reported uh, to be actually living better lives, feeling better about themselves. That surely translates also into a financial impact because somebody who's happy is somebody who's creative, is somebody who's productive. Um, but um, if you'd like, we can come back with those actual numbers. Um, I can give you a relationship that I still have fresh in my head from my previous, I just moved here from the United States. Um, the arts sector in the United States is actually twice the size of the entire National Football League income. So when we think about classical arts and we're thinking of arts being a marginalized um, form, that's actually not true. If you take it in its entirety in the United States, it's larger than what I would call the most profitable and largest sports franchise the world has ever seen. And I'm not saying that because I'm American. It's actually bigger than FIFA. Um, but the art sector is larger. Global figures for the for the contribution of the arts to the economy. So I suppose I'm curious about how, at a company level, you feed into that and contribute to that in terms of the calculation that's done for your part of the economic contribution. So on a very basic level, um, we feed into it by providing people direct employment, which then obviously contribute to society. On on the secondary level, there are entire uh, infrastructures in our cities that would just be empty, would be barren. I mean, Royal Concert Halls in Glasgow, Usher Hall in Edinburgh, uh, Horse Cross in Perth, um, Majesty's Theatre up in Aberdeen. As companies, we don't e exist in a, a vacuum. Uh, we feed in through Scottish Government and perhaps Creative Scotland reports and so on to the, the sort of more global or at least national impact, economic impact. I think the economic impact of us 
as five companies is perhaps more difficult to define than the sector as a whole of which we are part. Can I, what, one of the national indicators um, from the Scottish Government and its national outcomes is, and I'll, I'll just quote it because none of you have mentioned it, is the, to increase cultural engagement, which is measured by the percentage of adults who have either participated in a cultural activity or who have attended or visited a cultural event or place in the last 12 months. That's one of the measurements that you're, you're measured against. But none of, you measure, none of you mentioned that in any of your responses there to those questions about how you measure success or how you see yourself as, as, as impacting on this in Scotland. If I can actually answer, because I didn't answer the how do we measure success, we have, my board has five indicators. One is artistic quality, one is um, adherence to budget, and that really means balancing your budget. One is audience participation, so that's exactly what you're quoting there. And one is very important, which is service to community. Um, but then the final one, which I think is equally important as all of the ones above, is actually internal morale of the company, musician morale. Um, are the musicians feeling that we are enabling them in the right way so that they can get the art to the people? Because at the end of the day, what we are is, is a conduit for an artistic process, but for an actual work of art to be presented to the people. But yes, uh, audience participation is essential. Could, well, could all of you tell me how each of you have increased cultural engagement? Can anybody tell me how you increased cultural engagement? Do, are you looking for uh, increased cultural engagement in terms of more people coming to hear us? We had in I'm this I'm year... I'm looking at it... Sorry, sorry Krishna. I'm looking mm. at it in terms of the Scottish Government indicator for its national outcomes. It may not be a perfect measurement, but I'm just wondering what your view is. There's a quantitative, quantitative measurement. I mean, one of it is the audience figures you have in front of you, which tells you the percentage... We could work out what the percentage was of the Scottish population engaging with particular activities in the companies. The other thing is what I was talking about of um, how significantly we're part of public life. And, and I think that's what I was talking to there was, um, and that's, uh, you can both put a number on it, but it's also qualitative around engagement around particular subjects, about particular events where we're providing that cultural engagement um, with, with deb um, questions that people want want to discuss and think about so uh, I think there's there's both measurements we do but maybe not in that uh, by giving the bald percentage which is something perhaps we should be doing I'm, I'm not arguing with you at all you do no. both qualitative and quantitative work and, yeah. I, and, I, and, and it's measured in many ways uh, it's just the fact that and, I'm, and I'm, I'm you know I'm reading out directly what is one of the Scottish government indicators for your sector uh, and so therefore accepting all that you've said um, what I'm asking directly is, what is the answer to that question in terms of that indicator? It's the amount of contact we have, whether it's participative or... No, I, I know what it is. I'm asking you what you've done to achieve it. Well, I, think I think the numbers are there, aren't they? And, and all of the examples we've given you about how we uh, make the work accessible to various groups and various audiences is all feeding into that. That, that's, I think that's what the body of what we've been discussing is all around that cultural engagement. And I think it's, it's important that we're able to demonstrate that there, there's audience um, uh, participation, you like audience members. I mean, I've got figures in front of me of 120,000 audience members in the last year, but it's also the ancillary participations that happen around education and outreach, which can, which can be anything in the 20 and 30,000. Um, and, and above, depending on you know, the, the breadth and whether that's just in Scotland or whether that's international as well, because we do continue our education outreach when we go offshore as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll a couple of something. John and then Liam. Very cool. And the fact can be that everybody else has been taking opportunities to do a pug. Can I do a pug on behalf of Mogul Concert uh, Hall, uh, which has terrific star attractions over the next two or three weeks? And I would more than put an offer out for you to come along and, and see it. But it's to go back to <laughs> it's to go back to obviously how you measure success and obviously you know your funding is is uh, associated with delivering obviously Scottish government objectives. And uh, and I was wondering if your success in some way is being constrained because you do have to deliver these objectives or is it something you are able to deliver in partnership or would you be able to deliver you know, a higher degree of success if, if you're unhinged from delivering those objectives. 
Personally, I think for the, um, the objectives actually um, ensure that we're exercising to the broadest um, we possibly can. It's ensuring that there's um, that we're engaging not just on the stage or in the concert hall, that we're engaging beyond that with the community, that we're actually making a difference socially as well, and that we're helping to, I guess, in a sense, build a stronger society and that we're, we're not resting on our laurels and just doing wonderful productions. It's ensuring that we've got a sense of social responsibility that comes with the sort of support that the government affords us. I don't... I certainly don't feel constrained by them. In many ways, they, they actually help you articulate what we're there to do. Um, so I, in many ways, once you get used to them, they're actually quite helpful. Yes, I agree. I think they tend to describe what a national company does and articulate that. So I think that we all find that they're um, part and parcel of what we, the work we do every day. So um, I'd agree. I'm going to be very boring and just agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, the, the, natural, the natural companies are, uh, I think, because of these criteria, are more complex. But the point of it is that we're national companies and not just a city organization. It's, it's, I mean, you would be doing this work anyway. Yeah. This is, yeah. the, this is the kind of work that you assume yeah. is part of your yeah. remit anyway. Um, and yeah. it, I think you described it, it, it. Effectively, this describes what you would do anyway. Yeah. 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 Okay, sorry. Uh, Liam. That's perfect. I mean, Alex started off describing, um, I think, the, the, the strength that's gained from the, the model within which you operate. We've just seen an example of the, um, the, uh, the show of unity that a committee like this, I think, finds slightly unsettling. Um, in terms of those success factors we've talked about, to what extent is there a, a, a sense that one company's gain is another company's pain. To what extent is there a fluctuation in terms of what you are doing, you hitting your KPIs, is going to mean that, that your funding from government is, is pretty much assured, but that may, and, and may expand to allow you to do more of what you've been doing so well, but that will come at the expense of another company. How do you retain that sense of unity when presumably there must be a degree of, of challenge within... Uh, within your engagement with the Scottish Government? I don't think there's any interest for any of us in one of the other companies not doing well. I think it's in our collective interest that we're a success. Um, the area where I suppose the gloves come off is, is when it comes to fundraising and, and things like that, where there is a, an element of, actually in many ways, healthy competition. But bid to Scottish Government about this, this is how we've hit our KPIs. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's not with a view of securing additional funding. Actually, you see it in, in your interest to, to have a degree of stability across all the national companies. Yes. I mean, there is maybe... Uh, it, it depends how his, one looks back and, and how it develops in the future, but since our funding levels were set in the, in the first year of, of direct funding, um, they have gone up or down collectively. They, there hasn't been variations in that. Uh, the one area, I suppose, where we do compete as well is for the International Touring Fund, which is a defined pot, and we all have plans and we have aspirations beyond the limits of the fund. Um, but um, we all pitch for that and, and um, we all do well or, or less well from one year to the next. That's helpful. Can I, can I finish on one question? I mean, we're, we're roughly speaking at the 10th anniversary of, of the establishment of the national companies. Near enough, anyway. Uh, and I just wondered, where do you see the national companies going in the next 10 years? I mean, it's been an interesting 10 years, you know, and I think for those of us who have been around here a, a lot longer than that, it was, an, it was interesting before those 10 years. And I think you mentioned, Roy, earlier some of the instability that, 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 that went before. Um, uh, and I remember some of the difficulties that Scottish Opera had um, uh, some time ago. Um, certainly the early years were... Yes, and I, I was thinking that, yes, in the high street. I remember, I remember the groups of singers in the high street. But, you know, given the difficulties that, that were in the past, we've had some st stability. Um, we're in a, a difficult economic cycle, part of the economic cycle at the moment, um, in terms of funding, clearly. But there's been much success across all of the national companies over the last 10 years. Given all of that mixed history, where do you see the, each of your companies going over the next 10 years? I'm going to start, Chris, if you want to. I think that the, um, the support um, and the continued support um, is something that does give us a, a solid structure on which to build. And I know that um, it gives us immense pride when we're outside of Scotland and we're asked how we're able to achieve 
such an amazing production, such amazing performance, to say that there is um, a consciousness from government to invest in the arts and in culture and to have a national portfolio. Um, it's something that's celebrated. Um, so I think going forward, it would be great to see that we're leading, not following in that respect, in terms of how national companies are not just funded, but something we touched on earlier, how they're accountable, how they can account for their position in society and their relevance. Okay, thank you. Roy? I, th I think the last 10 years has been a, a real success story. Um, having said that, um, there is a danger, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that our, our funding, and it applies to all the companies, is now in cash terms less than it was 10 years ago. And that was part of the origins of the problems in the 90s and the early 2000s. So I think if, if, the, if uh, the funding of the national companies continues to decline or stagnate, I think the next 10 years will it'll be much more difficult for it to be a success. And um, there may have to be some hard choices made. Um, the, talking about all our education outreach work and our concert, actually the the potential for the five companies is almost infinite it, and it does come down to resources and uh, what we've achieved over the last 10 years I think is 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 really fantastic and I've been here since 1993 um, so there's a lot to compare with but um, I think this this dangerous time aside ahead, ahead if uh, money continues to, de to decline and although we're the biggest of the uh, cultural companies in Scotland, we are just as fragile as, as the rest are. It's a fragile sector, and um, it would be easy for it to go in, into crisis. Okay. Laurie? Yes, yeah, so I back that up. I think we're making a really big impact relatively to the resource that we, we get. Um, and there's a fear that um, we won't be able to actually be ambitious about increasing the national reach, which is what I feel that we need to do at the National Theatre of Scotland, find new ways of reaching more of the country more regularly, which is, would be my ambition, um, and that that would be a very difficult ambition to, uh, to reach if funding was to be uh, radically um, reduced. Um, um, so I think that we could be fe um, facing a really confident future together as a, as a sector, but we uh, are in danger of being hit by the triple whammy of the cuts to local authorities and cuts to Creative Scotland. And as a company that only works in partnership with other venues, other artists, other companies, and that's the basis of the Theatre Without Walls model, we're in danger of being hit three times over. Um, so there, there is some uh, uncertainty and some fear in the sector in general uh, and for us as a national company about the, the future when actually we're poised to really capitalise on, on what's been for us only 10 years. Um, but I think the impact that we've made internationally as well as nationally has been huge. And I really hope that we can face the future with confidence and, create, and continue that. Thank you. Yeah, Krishna. I think uh, the RSNO in future years will continue to be a national leader as, as the national orchestra, but will also play a role internationally as an arts leader. Um, I think the fact that we are going back to the United States in early 2017 after an absence of 30 years is testament both to what can go uh, wrong in 30 years, which is where you sort of disappear from the world scene, in large part because of funding uh, instability, and how easy it is for us to actually reconnect with the world because we're so present still in the world with our recordings that people really want to go and, and, and hear us. Um, if, if, we, if I can articulate my challenges, my concerns, um, if, uh, funding, of course, is always a concern, but I think the, I have a bigger concern because especially the RSNO and to a certain extent, of course, also the SCO are international creatures. We get a lot of our talent from abroad. Um, so funding is one issue, but the other issue that I see as a concern is in, uh, insecurity as to what's going to happen uh, regarding uh, the next election cycles, the Brexit campaign. All of these things actually aren't helpful. Um, long term when we're thinking about being an international organization, regardless of how the outcome is, it's the uncertainty about them that is difficult. Thank you. Anne. Um, I don't want to unnerve you any further, but I do agree with my, my colleagues. Um, the last 10 years for the for Scottish Opera have been um, very successful. The company has definitely been on an upward trajectory, and as you know, Alex had to leave to go and 
um, to attend our North American debut. Um, that is a work which is the culmination really of almost those 10 years work. Um, it's a new opera written by Stuart McRae, who's one of Scotland's finest composers with a libretto by Louise Welsh, who's one of our finest writers. Um, and based on a, a short story by Robert Louis Stevenson. So it's got lots of credentials. Stuart and Louise started working with the company about eight years ago on a short 15 minute opera. They then produced a 45 minute opera a couple of years later. This is now a full length opera, which has received fantastic acclaim, um, both from audiences and from critics, um, has toured England and Wales, and is now going to, to Canada. Um, so, we want to see that continue. We obviously share the others' financial concerns, but we feel that our trajectory is going upwards, and that's how we would like it to continue. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, and can I thank all of the witnesses who uh, came along this morning and so generously gave their time to the committee. Um, I, I, you know, I appreciate you're all busy people, but thank you for coming. Um, and I should also thank Alex, who's not here at the moment. Uh, I don't think I've ever had anybody who's left the committee to go to Canada before. I think that's a first. But uh, again, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, this morning, and can I suspend briefly? Our final item is to consider petition PE01420 by Theresa McNally on behalf of Clax Kinship Care on recognising the real value of kinship carers and giving them parity with foster carers across Scotland. Uh, do members have any comments on the petition? Any comments to make? The stage, okay. Um, well, therefore, can I ask the members what action they wish to take on the petition? Um, clearly, we had a... a, a statutory instrument last week which dealt with uh, kinship care from the government um, uh, so with that in mind I don't know whether members wish to uh, explain what their view is about what we do with this petition Liam Convener, um, last week when we were dealing with the statutory instrument that appears to address the concerns that were raised with us through the petition so I, I think on that basis um, it would be appropriate to, to close the petition Okay, thank you um, Anybody else? What? Colin? Sorry? I, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think it's already been dealt with, and I think that uh, we close the petition. Yeah. I agree. Okay, that seems to be agreed by um, other members of the committee. I, I would agree. I think that the, the government has responded to the petition, um, and with the statutory instrument last week, that deals with, it may not deal with 100% of what was been asked, but I think it's dealt with the issue uh, fairly uh, well. Therefore, I would agree that, uh, uh, with Liam that I think in terms of this committee's view, we should close the petition um, at this stage. Is that agreed? Great. That's agreed. Uh, before I close the meeting, can I just say this is the last, although we have a meeting next week, this is the last public meeting 
of the committee um, in this session. Um, so can I thank all of the members of the committee who are present here today, but also those who have been members of the committee over the last five years. We've had a few changes over the years. Um, I know that uh, committee members um, have had, I think, hopefully an interesting time on this committee over the last five years. It's been a, a fascinating five years for me as convener, and I want to thank each of you individually for your support and for the work you've done on the committee in ensuring that uh, we, we have held the government to, come to account on legislation, but we've also examined uh, a whole variety of different parts of the sector which we are also responsible for. So can I thank you all for uh, the work that you've put in um, over the years. I can also thank, I'm, I'm sure on behalf of the committee members, the clerks, um, who I think have done an outstanding job in supporting the committee, uh, and also SPICE, representatives from SPICE, who again have done a tremendous job in supporting the committee. And also in terms of the work that um, sometimes members don't see uh, going on uh, behind the scenes, for example, the press releases that go out, I want to thank also um, the work behind the scenes that goes on from officials to ensure that all of that uh, takes place, uh, and also from all the, all the other people who, make, all the people who make the committee work on the day when we're here in, in Parliament, but also when we've gone out visiting. Um, here, of course, we have the official report, who I think uh, uh, most of us uh, check afterwards, N not for accuracy, I have to say, but to, to make sure that we haven't made a fool of ourselves. But thank you very much for the work you do, but also for the broadcasting team and for the sound team, who, again, uh, do a great job, and also for the security people uh, and also the other staff who provide the, the coffee and tea uh, as well. So thank you very much to everybody uh, uh, from, on my behalf as convener but also uh, from everybody else, I'm sure. Um, it's been, a, I think, a very interesting five years, and I think this committee can hold its head high in terms of the work that it's done over the, the whole session. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, can I uh, close the meeting? <laughs>